Andrew, I met him like a year ago, just this friendly guy that I said, hey, I want to go to the, the Singapore Speaking Association. And I randomly asked him, could you invite me? And he says, yeah, of course. Um, tell them I sent you. And since then, I've been following him on his travels and his journeys. And he ended up in a place right next to sunny Spain, which who knows geography? What's next to sunny Spain? Portugal. Yes, it is. So he ended up in Portugal very, very um, recently, and he's calling from there today. Andrew has been in this industry for 25 years. He's been making messages that obviously have been extremely valuable and memorable, or else he wouldn't be our guest today and uh, a leading speaker in the industry. He was the president of the Asia Professional Speakers Association in Singapore. He is an executive coach, a global expert on self-leadership. He's a C-suite advisor. He's a certified professional, prof certified professional professional, mm. certified speaking professional, which was not easy to get, so not easy to say apparently. <laughs> and obviously working across the world in the 25 years, working proudly in Singapore, Silicon Valley, and he's here to inspire us as he's inspired and informed thousands of people over these last 25 years. He's gonna help us understand how to be more creative and collaborative, and which is something necessary as leaders in this digital age, we need to step it up. He's British by birth, Australian by passport, and Brazilian by wife. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Andrew Bryant? Well, good morning, good morning from a not so sunny uh, Portugal this morning, slightly overcast, uh, but the waves are coming in. Okay, yes, it's a virtual background and this is no longer a surprise. Um, but what is a surprise to me is to see so many uh, friendly faces. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Jessica. Uh, in fact, it was Lindsay Adams who actually handed me my CSP certified speaking professional. Thank you there, Mr. Uh, Lindsay Adams. Uh, before we started, we had a quick chat in Bahaza with Wendy because I lived in Singapore and spent a lot of time in Malaysia. So um, my topic today that I was briefed on is uh, intentionality. And so let's forget all of that um, virtual background stuff and uh, transport you to uh, my apartment. No, it's another virtual background, I'm sorry, uh, in, uh, in Portugal. And this is the topic today, intention, the key to speaking success. And so my question, I guess, that I need to answer is, how did I get here to Portugal in the midst of pandemic? How did I continue to grow and expand my speaking, coaching, facilitating, transformational business in the midst of a pandemic? I think that's a question worthy to answer because uh, many of you have struggled with your businesses, some of you have pivoted, and some of you have entered into the speaking domain in the midst of, well, we have to be frank about it, is that we have to be in the midst of a time when it's very difficult to get on a stage. And if you are on a stage, you will be wearing a mask. So how did I get here? Well, let me take you back. Let me take you back uh, 22 years to a coffee shop. And it's early morning, which it is for some of you here. And I could smell the coffee. I could smell breakfast but I didn't feel like coffee, which was atypical for me because I love my coffee. I didn't feel like breakfast because I felt sick. I felt sick to my stomach. Why? Because I had booked this coffee shop for my first professional speech because I had realized that nobody books you unless you have been seen and you don't get seen unless you get booked. And a friend of mine who had a background in marketing said, well, why don't you book yourself? Book out a book out a, a coffee shop. We'll sell tickets for breakfast, breakfast and a speech. And the speaker was me. And of course, I said to myself, the immortal worlds that we all have said to ourselves at some point in our lives, how hard could it be? 
Well, it turned out to be a lot harder than I thought. I got through the speech. I don't think it was a great speech, but it was sufficient to let me know that I needed to learn about speaking. For those of you who want a trip down memory lane, this was the marketing that we used for that first speech. It was a, a postcard, there I am with hair, and my first ever professional speech was health is wealth. So I want to take you from that moment through a journey that many of you have been uh, on in terms of speaking. And I, I don't know where you are with your brand new and or your experience like Lindsay you know, Lindsay and I, of course, when you become a professional male speaker for enough years, uh, there is a certain signature, and that is the lack of hair. Uh, if you look at a number of the successful professional male speakers, they are, like me and Lindsay, sporting a solar panel for a sex machine. But what I want to talk to you about is not my hairstyle, but the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, many of you will have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Give me a thumbs up if you've already heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes, of course. And Lindsay actually sat through a speech of mine where I did this some years ago. I'm not going to do the whole thing, Lindsay. It's okay. Um, my speaker's journey is on a video that is on my YouTube channel. But I just want to familiarize you, for those of you who haven't been on this journey uh, with me before, the Dunning-Kruger effect, because I think it sets us up for intentionality. And it also helps you understand what you need to set in terms of intention wherever you are on the speaker's journey. So the Dunning-Kruger effect is really a cognitive bias on how we are unaware of our own ignorance. We are ignorant of our ignorance. And so we start any endeavor at the peak of confidence with very little experience and this is known as the peak of stupidity. And in that coffee shop 22 plus years ago, I was at the peak of stupidity because I'm saying to myself, how hard could it be? In fact, I even hired people to record my first speech, assuming that it would be a product because I'd heard that's what you do, not realizing that I would needed to practice it a few times. So how hard could it be? Some of us are there right now. I want to be a professional speaker. How hard can it be? But then you discover that there's more to this than I thought. Now you have to learn about video and virtual backgrounds and microphones and all of these things. Whereas back in the day, Lindsay and Sally, I see that you're on the call too. All we had to do was learn how to walk out on a stage and say, good morning. So what this tends to lead us to is the next phase, which is the valley of despair. And in the valley of despair, we end up saying to ourselves, I never going to learn this. And we see in speakers associations around the world, we see that people will get to a point and they'll go, you know, this is too hard. It's like people who buy sporting equipment that will end up underneath the stairs. They'll say, I'll be a speaker. They join an association. And then six months later, we never see them again because they don't set an intention that this is a profession. If you, if you want to be a doctor, it's six to eight years to get started. If you want to be most, most professions, it's a four-year degree. And so if you've only just started, you need to set an intention that there's more to this. But over time, you start to get it. Whatever you're learning, whether it's golf or tennis or learning a language, you think, I'm starting to get this. And, and I got asked yesterday, and I'll talk about this in a little while, you know, when did I know that I was starting to get Portuguese? And I said it was when I could start reading signs in elevators or you know, on the roadside. I started to go, oh, I know what that means. And so we start up the slope of enlightenment. And eventually, we want to get to at least the plateau of sustainability so that we have a business. And then like Lindsay and myself with our bald heads, we can say, trust me, it's complicated. Now, just a quick question here. Where are you? on this journey. Now, I don't need you to tell me, but I need you to be honest with yourself. Are you at the beginning? Are you in this hubris? How hard can it be? Are you struggling with realizing that there's so much to learn? Are you at the point of despair? And this is your last meeting uh, of a speaker's association. And whether you learn something from me or not, you know, this is the end or this is the point that you're committed. Are you starting to get it and wanting to raise your skills to the next level? Or are you, trust me, it's complicated, and I'm just here because, you know, I'm supporting Andrew. Um, so where are you? you? You don't need to tell me. You don't need to tell anybody else. 
but you need to know for yourself. Energy flows where attention flows. Sorry, en energy goes where attention flows as governed by intention. Now, the first part of this, uh, you might have heard Tony Robbins say, he's quite fond of saying energy goes where attention flows. The full phrase possibly came from Richard Bandler, who uh, Tony Robbins learned his NLP from. I learned this full phrase from a mentor of mine, Dr. Michael Hall, many years ago. And it really helped me understand this, the power of intentionality, because our energy goes with what we're paying attention to. But what we're paying attention to is governed by our intentionality. And it's really interesting, the latest studies on consciousness, that we um, are mostly um, like, like dogs going squirrel, you know, shiny thing, unless we set intentionality. And the growth of disciplines like mindfulness, very much about this concept of paying attention to what you're paying attention to. And if you are paying attention to what you're paying attention to, then that can put you at choice point where you can say, oh, this is what I want to pay attention to. Now, an example of this is Mr. Jim Carrey. And Mr. Jim Carrey, um, many of you will have come across the concept that he, or the story that he understood intentionality and wrote himself a $10 million check for services rendered when he was a struggling actor. As a struggling actor, he said to himself, one day I am going to be paid $10 million for acting. And he gave himself a three to five year runway on that intentionality. So that intentionality was a goal. But three years later, he was paid $10 million for dumb and dumber. Now, I want you to remember this because I'll come back to Jim Carrey right at the end. I'll do what most speakers do or many speakers do is I'm going to bookend this story and I'm flagging and I am uh, foreshadowing that I'm bookending this $10 million check. Has anybody set an intention to be paid $10 million for a speech? Now, speakers are paid $100 million for a speech, but it helps if you've been a president of the United States, if that's what you want to do. So I'm going to talk about three things today, direction, vehicle, and driving. And I chose a graphic here. Some of you will recognize that Dr. Rick Goodman, who is my co-pilot here, as we are doing a road trip from uh, Magoito near Sintra, where I live, up to Porto, which is a beautiful part of Portugal. And I have just uh, acquired a car only a week before Rick visited me for my 60th birthday back in August. And I acquired a car in Portugal. Now, in England, they drive on the left, which is where I learned to drive. In America, they drive on the right, where I have driven. But in Portugal, they drive in the shadow of the car in front. And so learning to drive in Portugal was a new experience. I'm driving on the what I consider the wrong side. And I'm driving a manual shift because that's all I could get due to the chip shortage in Europe and an inability to get an automatic car. And so when I drove this car out of the showroom, it was a bit stressful. Um, I'd been driving since I was 17, but suddenly it felt like I was learning to drive again. Wrong side of the road, stick shift on roads I didn't know. All I wanted to do when I drove that car out of the showroom was take it home and read the manual. My wife, on the other hand, said, hey, we have a car. We're going to Ikea or Ikea for my Swedish friends. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm, frankly, I lost my man card in the Ikea car park when I stuck this car in reverse and discovered, to my surprise, it did not have a reverse camera. So Rick became my coach as we drove up to Portugal, screaming at me to shift gears and keep my hand on the gear shift. Keep your hands on the gear shift as we take you through this. Now, another story that I just want to use as a setup here is to ask you, what is your direction for your business? Direction is the first part of this three-part speech. And a few months before I left Singapore for Portugal, I was driving my daughter, Tasha, to the optometrist. She'd been complaining she couldn't see things at a distance. And so I said, okay, Saturday morning, we'll go to the optometrist. As we're driving to the optometrist, 
she says to me, oh, how am I going to learn to drive? She's just turning, she just turned 16 and she's super curious. And I said, well, it's easy. You know, um, I'm going to teach you. I'm a good teacher. I'm a good driver. Not a problem. She said, oh, okay. And how am I going to know where to go? I said, well, that's easy too, because these days you have GPS. In my day, when back in my day, you know, we had to learn to read an A to Z map to navigate. And she said, oh. And I said, you just follow the street signs. And she looked at the street signs, really curious and somewhat perplexed. I didn't understand this until we went to the optometrist. She got her uh, assessment and 20 minutes later, she had her glasses, amazing Japanese franchise where you get your glasses 20 minutes later. She puts on the glasses and she says, oh, wow, I can read those uh, shop signs all the way over there. And I'm super proud that, you know, I've solved this problem for my daughter. A little chagrined. It took me a month or so to do it. But the real surprise came on the drive home because suddenly she looks at the street signs and says, oh, there's writing on the street signs with the street names. And I was completely unaware that she was struggling to see those. And as an experienced speaker, trust me, it's complicated. For those of you who are still going, how hard can it be? There's a disconnect sometimes. We don't see that you don't read the street signs. And so when you listen to other speakers who have driven the road before, pay attention because they know some things that you don't and it could be super useful. You see, here's the first real key nugget that I didn't realize at the beginning of my speaking career, that speaking isn't a direction, it's the vehicle. You see, some of you will have seen a speaker and go, God, how hard could it be? I wanna do that. They get a round of applause, they stand on a stage, or they, they travel at the front of the plane, all of these things that you hear. And you go, I wanna be a speaker, I wanna be there, because that's what I said. But the, being a speaker isn't the vehicle. There are many speakers who went out of business when the pandemic hit. There are many speakers that have gone out of business as they've got older and are no longer relevant. Speaking is just one vehicle. And I'm going to talk about a number of vehicles that the spoken word will allow you to do. Don't focus on being a speaker. Focus on building a business. David Averin, I think, was speaking on this uh, on the marketing. And David, good friend of mine, says, you know, speaking isn't the business. Getting the gig is the business. You need to build a business. And speaking is just a vehicle. A vehicle takes you from point A to point B. So way back when, what was my intention? What was my direction? The intention that informed my direction is and was to this date to wake people up to options and opportunities. I, in, in the late 1990s, you know, was, was full on in terms of the work I was doing with athletes and, and sports psychology and coaching people and seeing the difference that I could make in people's lives and seeing the lights come on in their eyes. And that's what I love to do. And so when I started speaking, that's what I started speaking about. I spoke about what I knew. Now, it evolved and developed over time, but that was the original direction. So take a deep breath with me and ask yourself the question, what is your direction? Is it to just be a speaker or are you trying to make a difference? Are you intending to make a difference? So I want to share with you some ideas on how that can happen. And firstly, how I translated that was through the vehicle of self-leadership. Now, self-leadership wasn't my direction. It was a vehicle that allowed my intentionality. And I started talking about self-leadership back in 1999. And uh, in 2012, I wrote the book that you can see here with Dr. Anna Kazan. And we kind of own the definition of self-leadership these days, which is the practice of intentionally influencing your thinking, feeling, and actions towards your objectives. And so intentionality is right there baked into the methodology that I talk about. So intention is the big why. Intention is the big why. Now, there's a small why and there's a big why. Um, in fact, uh, Matt Church talks about this a little bit or used to many, many years ago, Lindsay. You know, the little I is it, well, it's ego. It's it's driving the things that we, we want to do. The big I is your purpose, your mission, 
uh, what your vision, what it is that you want to do. And so you might have a little eye. You know, we, we, we need to feed the family. We want to do those things. But we need a big eye, a purpose over and above. And so, you know, you can draw a little graph here in terms of your big I or your why and time plus effort. And if you think about how you go about it in life, right, if you only have a small I, a, just it's you're just doing it out of your ego, you don't really have a purpose. If you put in some time and effort, you get a result that looks a bit like this, okay? result. But if you have a big eye, tiny little bit more effort, and you get this much more of a result. And so intention is the big I or the big Y, and it creates the big impact. And you will see the speakers that have been successful and have longevity are driven by this. And if you are chatting to one of them, ask them, what is their big Y? Now, what does that translate to? Well, all sorts of things. So since I found intentionality around self-leadership, I could have selfleadership.com, selfleadership.tv, which is my uh, just points to my YouTube channel. It means that everything I do in terms of my YouTube is around self-leadership and leadership. And I also have a channel on professional speaking and then a sub-intentionality around my intentionality for women in leadership. So there is a channel on that. And so I know why I'm creating creating these videos. Now, the small ego is, oh, yes, I want the likes and I want the followers and the subscribers. Feel free to add a subscription there. Um, but the big why is that means I can impact more people. So we've talked about direction leading to a vehicle, vehicles being speaking. And, and here I am with my vehicle outside of my house uh, in Portugal. And the interesting thing to think about vehicles, because I love the etymology of things, what, what does vehicle mean? It means a thing used to express, embody, or fulfill something. And actually, that's what we're always doing for our clients, isn't it? Helping them to express themselves, embody what it is they want to do. And so here is a huge list of all the ways that you can do. This is Magoito Beach, which I opened up with. Um, I love the little Vespa. This one's not mine, um, but I think it just sets off the photo. But here's a list of the various vehicles we can use these days. Platform speaking, the very thing that we, we all aspire to and hopefully will come back soon. It's all, I've already done a couple of live speeches in the last uh, month. Virtual speaking, which, of course, I'm doing right now. Individual coaching, group coaching, facilitation, training, online courses, podcasts, social media posts, blogging, vlogging, articles and books. And I probably missed something on that list. Take a deep breath. What are you focusing on? What's your top three? What do you want to add? What do you want to subtract? Because I wouldn't recommend that you do it all. Focus on what actually takes you forward as a vehicle. Now, you might have different vehicles for different contexts. I have the car for driving. Maybe I'll get a Vespa. I had one in Singapore. Um, that was great for zipping into town. And, you know, the parking wasn't, uh, wasn't too hard. Now, um, Steve Lau will talk to you about moment, message, and model. And uh, I've been saying the same thing. Uh, as the Global Speakers Federation uh, president, let's give him a shout out uh, for that. That as you speak or facilitate or coach, you will often share a moment that you had your inspiration, your road to Damascus epiphany about why you're speaking about what you're speaking. People survive cancer and they want to talk about how you can survive cancer. People climb Mount Everest and talk about how you can overcome the mountains in your life. And from that moment of life experience, either positive or challenging, you create a message for your audience. Now, a lot of people stop there. They, they've had this moment in their life and they want to tell everybody about how they suddenly realized how to be a great parent or have a fantastic relationship. And there's a little cynical thing that we have in the speaking profession is that we 
teach best that which we found hardest to learn. So if you're ever at the uh, the National Speakers Convention in America where you get 12,000 people, no, these days it's you know, 1,800 people, um, but if you ever, ever go there, you'll bump into people and somebody will say, I'm a relationship speaker. And I go, OK, then your marriage is in trouble then. Um, no, <laughs> I speak about self-leadership because I needed self-leadership. But here's what Steve Lowell tells you about building a business is none of that is OK unless you have a model. And he will show you a model and ask you where you are on that model. And you will see whether you have a need. I showed you somebody else's model the Dunning-Kruger effect and asked you where you are. But when it came to self-leadership, I built my own models. I have my own validated psychometric tests so that I can own the area of self-leadership. Now, there are many people who speak about self-leadership. Sally on the call talks about self-leadership. I don't own the concept, but I can own the models. So here's my money model. It's not just mine, but let me share with you just so that you can check all of the things on here that you need to be thinking about. Keynote speech, absolutely. Get paid a lot of money to be flown somewhere, put up in a nice hotel, turn up on stage, share your message or your model or your moment and get paid a lot of money. And then people come up and, and say thank you afterwards. It's awesome. It takes a lot of work, takes a lot of practice, takes a lot of marketing. I do C-level coaching. I work with C-level executives and I coach them. I do group coaching, uh, which I can do either B to B, business to business, or B to C. I can sell this. Each week I have a group coaching call and people have paid to be on that call and learn from me. Of course, I have online programs and evergreen products. Now, the difference between an online program is an online program tends to be uh, live. Um, an evergreen product is recorded and you can sell it over and over again. Now, a downloadable PDF or a, a, a book can be an evergreen product as long as you keep selling it. Quick look behind the scenes of, of how I do that. Um, these are obviously my products. I'm not trying to sell to anybody here, although if anybody wants to purchase a product, I'm not going to stand in the way of them getting my message. But I will do what's called a VSL, a video sales letter. So my marketing will send somebody to a page, and this is uh, an example. This one's going to be out of date very soon. But a VSL, in fact, you can go to selfleadership.com forward slash VSL, and it takes you to a page which has a, a hook and a video to connect. And this particular VSL is to invite people into my group coaching or one-to-one -one coaching program. You press play. I talk for 15, 20 minutes about uh, why, why you should do X and then what the value is of engaging me. And, and, or, you know, you can do um, for Black Friday, I did a LinkedIn live and I spoke. And then during the speaking, I said, well, you know, by the way, you know, you can get my self-leadership accelerator coaching and my 2016 book for just $7. Now, I hated doing this at the beginning of my speaking career, but hey, it pays the rent, people. Um, and by the way, if you want to go to Black Friday dash selfleadership.com, that offer is still live. So moving forwards. Oh, I, I just couldn't resist this. I got this last night. Uh, my new book is coming out in the first quarter of 2022. The new leadership playbook is ready. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But the interesting thing about this, and let me just tell you this story about the power of leverage. A client came to me and said, look, you coach our senior leaders, but we have a problem. We have... Um, some you know, new time leaders, first time leaders. This is actually Sally Foley Lewis's uh, sweet spot. And they need some of the frameworks and the models that you've taught our senior leaders. Do you do that? And I said, well, I used to do that many years ago. I used to do training. I used to do a three-day critical skills for senior leaders. He said, could you, could you write us a book on it? I said, no, I don't think you can pay me enough to write your book on it. Um, you know, do you want me to do a workshop? And I said, well, we want a workshop, but we want something in their hands. And I said, okay, well, what is your budget? And they told me, and I said, well, I'll tell you what. I could do you the workshops, and there was about six workshops they wanted uh, for this fee, and I'll include the text, but I own the IP. And they said, oh, that's fine. We just, as long as we can use it for ourselves. I said, you can't use it for anybody else, but you can print it for yourself. They said, deal. So I did six workshops. They paid me uh, a fair fee for that. I was very happy. Um, 
and I wrote the book that they needed. And then I had the IP. And then it sat there for a few months, well, about nine months, sitting there as at about 16,000 words because they didn't want a lot of stories in it because they had the workshop. And then I went, okay, I've got this. And so then I hired an editor um, and said, okay, I need to convert this to a book. It's now 40,000 words and it's now coming out. It's in the editing process. But do you see, I could have just sold the workshop. I could have just sold the book, but I sold both. And by the way, I've got the recordings of the workshop. I can turn into a product too. So this is how your intentionality about getting a business needs to happen. So we're moving through. We've talked about direction. We've talked about vehicle. We've talked about driving. Now, if you have a question about anything that I've talked about, um, write the question in the chat box and I will zoom into those questions in a moment. By the way, I was asked to do a speech, not a workshop, so this isn't hugely interactive. Um, I, I think that there's a message here that you can take away. I will, however, as a value add, offer you to answer the question. Uh, my only caveat and rule for answering a question is that your video is on. Is that a reasonable contract? Very good. Okay. So driving, what happens with driving? Punctures, right? Your, your driving can get punctured. Now, I've it's been a long time since I had a puncture, but I was walking back from the beach yesterday. Lo and behold, I saw somebody repairing a puncture. And of course, we all know what has punctured a lot of our businesses over the last two years. And it's this thing. And I you know this picture. And I really don't want to spend any time giving this any more airplay than it already has. But here's the thing. It's about strategy, isn't it? Now, I love chess. Now, I'm not hugely good at it. I was self-taught and I taught my son. Um, I'm now playing with my good friend, Frederick Haran, a uh, uh, speaker on creativity. I spent a week on his island in Sweden earlier this year uh, doing a creativity retreat and we were playing chess and, uh, and, and coaching each other or mentoring each other through that. And he, uh, uh, he's, he's been beating me. Um, and uh, so I, I've, I've upped my game and now we're about even. But this story is not about Frederick. This story is about my son, Nathan, because it was interesting. I taught him and the same thing happened. He got better and better. And I remember this game, oh, it was about a year ago, and he had me cornered. And I'm like, oh, wow, how did that happen? And the thing about chess is sometimes it looks like there's no way out. But if you stay focused... And ask yourself this question, do you have options? And when COVID hit, a lot of people went, well, there are no options, right? Nobody can move. Nobody can do anything. But there are always options because options lead to opportunities. When you see the op option, you can find the opportunity. And do you know where opportunity comes from? It comes from the Latin ab opportens, which means a favorable wind that will take you back to port. And just like a typhoon is a wind, a hurricane is a wind, an opportunity is the wind that takes you to the port of choice. But you have to be ready to hoist your sails. You have to look for options. Now, this is the option a lot of us ended up with, the virtual studio. This isn't mine. This is Ron Kaufman's. Ron Kaufman, the uh, service guy, the up your service guy. And uh, he came to me uh, and said, you know, I want to I want to take it up to the next level with OBS. And, and I said, well, how are you running? He said, on a laptop. And I said, yeah, you don't run it on a laptop. Now, Ron never does anything in half measures. And so this is Ron's setup at, at, at home now. The laptop is still there, but he went off and bought himself a big beast of a computer so that he could handle the processing. And this is it. Now, if you're running your virtual business off a laptop, yeah, I would have I, I, I would have concerns about that. The things get hot. You need to have the equipment. You need to invest in yourself and your business. Now, I understand when money is tight. I bootstrap my company. I know what that feels like. But when the money comes in, reinvest in your own education, in your own equipment, invest in yourself. And you know what? Over the years, I found that is the one thing that speakers are terrible at is investing in themselves. Set an intentionality to put a certain amount of your income away into investing into getting some coaching for platform skills, if that's what you're weak at, for technical skills, if that's what you're weak at. 
Invest in making sure you've got the right technology to move forwards. Because punctures will happen. Now, this story has a happy ending because I'm talking to you today. But earlier this year, I had a puncture. See, knowing I was going to Portugal, I went to my doctor and, you know, how hard could it be? I'm thinking, get a medical test. You know, I'm, I'm fully insured in Singapore. You know, just do everything. And I said to him, you know, three years since my last colonoscopy, should I have another one? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, uh, probably you should do my cholesterol. He said, yes, yes. And he said, while we're at it, we'll do your cancer markets. And I said, yeah, throw it in. How hard could it be? Until I got the phone call. Hi, Andrew, it's Dr. Sia. I said, hi. He said, your blood tests are back. I said, oh, yeah, great. He said, um, one of them came back positive for cancer, the marker for pancreatic cancer, at which point I sat on the floor. See, up until that point, I had I'd never even considered that there was anything wrong with me. And now, whilst it was only a marker, it didn't say I had pancreatic cancer, but it's like Schrodinger's cat in the box. I both had cancer and didn't have cancer simultaneously. He said, you know, when, we go for, when you go for the colonoscopy, you're going to need to have a CAT scan. I go, okay. So I set my intentionality to be positive. And I told just two people, and they said, oh, yeah, you need to be positive. And I just went, I'm not sure that's necessarily the best advice. I need to be pra practical because if this is pancreatic cancer, I'm going to need to put my affairs in order. And so I started to do that. Um, and if <clears throat> and if it isn't, then you know, what do I do coming out of this? I, I got the CAT scan and they said results next day. Next day, I'm doing what I'm doing now. I was on calls. My wife comes into my office at lunchtime and I said, oh, did the, did the doctor call? She said, yes, he did. And we have an appointment at two o'clock this afternoon. I've canceled your afternoon. That is not a good thing. We go to the doctor and he said, yeah, you don't have pancreatic cancer. Good news. And I'm like, great. He said, but you do have a big mass inside your abdomen and I'm sending you to a surgeon. I go to the surgeon. Surgeon says, yeah, you've got a big mass. We need to take it out. Now, I'm always keen on people's confidence. I asked him a question. I said, are you any good at this? And he said he was sort of taken back by the question. I don't think surgeons in Singapore are used to being challenged on their competence. But I said, you any good at this? He said, well, I spent a year in America just practicing this technique and I have good results. I said, OK. So sure enough, he, they, they, they sent me in and they took out uh, a lump. What was supposed to be a three hour operation was a six hour operation. When I came out, uh, the surgeon told my wife to prepare for the worst. So she's the real hero of this story because she wasn't supposed to tell me. I had a post-op fever, so I didn't know much about anything for three days, except I was miserable. But it was good news because after four days, the surgeon came in, sat on the side of my bed and said, great news. It was a lump. It was big, but it was benign. You're fine. You can get on with your life. Just don't eat raw broccoli. Now, it's a, it's a horrible story, and I, you know, I know that people are possibly on this call have faced challenges with cancer, and I'm sorry if I've triggered anybody's memories of anybody that, that you've lost. But here's the thing. Life is fragile, and we have to set an intentionality to live every day as if it's our last, and we need to leave a legacy. We need to make a difference. That's why we are doing this. So I'm sorry if this story is hard for you, but I think people still need to hear about these things because you can still achieve your goals. People have overcome much more difficulties than me. I was lucky. I had a really positive result. Sure enough, the intentionality to move for Portugal, which I'd set in 2020, went ahead. And this is us arriving at Lisbon Airport with all of our luggage. And my intention was to be able to be up and running as soon as I landed. I had the internet set up in my house before I left Singapore. And you can see uh, two boxes there, one for my CPU, one for my screen. And 24 hours after landing in Portugal, I gave a virtual speech. And this was just a month after having the surgery. So intentionality drives results. And here we are at the beach and, um, you know, uh, look up there, see that smiling face photobombing. That is the power behind the whole thing. And the person that I need to thank for getting me through this, uh, that's Andrea, my, my beautiful Brazilian wife. 
And uh, I hope that you set an intention to have good people around you. One of the things I learned going through this was to have a circle of trust or a circle of care. I didn't want to tell everybody. I created a WhatsApp group for my closest friends so that my wife could update them once we went through surgery. I only talked about it after I went through it. I wrote a blog in the hospital waiting to be discharged. That blog went viral. Um, and a lot of people have wrote to, written to me and said, the lessons that I shared in that blog, the self-awareness in that blog, help them through their challenges or help somebody else. So again, our intentionality makes an impact. So take a breath. Let all that stuff go for a moment and set your intention. Have you set your direction? Do you have your vehicle or vehicles? Which do you want to focus on? Which are not right for you right now? And can you drive on difficult roads? Are you capable for a puncture? Do you have a backup plan? So many people do not have a backup plan. So many people's businesses are what called a zombie business. Without them, there's nothing. I wanted to make sure that there was income and investments for my family if things didn't go the way I wanted them to go. So these are the tough questions. I know this is supposed to be an inspirational speech, but here's the thing, tough questions. That's what I'm good at. That's what I'm on the planet for. That's why CEOs hire me to do things. This is one of those CEOs. And uh, he, he responded once to one of our coachings with the direction you set today will drive your actions, which determine your results. This is Grant Halloran. I met him 20 plus years ago. He was the first CEO I ever coached. Now, being an executive coach, you want to have high, you know, high end clients, but they're always is the first. And I remember the conversation that I had with him. I'm sitting in his boardroom. I made a pitch that I should be his executive coach. And he asked a tough question. He said, okay, that's interesting, Andrew, but um, how many other CEOs have you coached or are you currently coaching? Well, the answer at that time was clearly zero. And I could feel my stomach sinking because if I'd said that, surely that would be the end of my credibility. But because I'd set the intention to have CEO clients, I looked him in the eye and confidently said, if you hire me, you will be the first. There was a pause. And I said, but imagine how focused I will be on getting you results. He said, good answer. Let's give it a try. Now, that try led to me coaching him, coaching his uh, his team, helping that business go and become acquired. He went off to the United States. Uh, didn't you know? We we lost contact for quite a few years, and then he came back to me a couple of years ago, and he said, uh, "You know, we should catch up." And he was in San Francisco. I was in Singapore. I was at an APSS convention auction, and I was. I think was I president at the time, or I think it was president. So I, I was intending to uh, make a lot of money for charity. So I bid high on some tickets on Turkish Airlines to anywhere in the world. They were our sponsor for that convention. Thank you, Turkish Airlines. And I bid and I won. And so I had this business class ticket to anywhere in the world. And uh, I had to use it by a certain time. And I thought something will come up. A client will want me to go somewhere. I'll bill the client and cash in. That was my intention. That was small eye, but big eye happened. I went, you know what? He needs me. And I used that ticket to go to San Francisco. It's the wrong way, by the way. From, from Singapore, you should go the other way uh, into San Francisco. But I flew through Istanbul. I flew to San Francisco, and I caught up with Grant. And he said, I've just been hired by a venture capital firm to take over this new company. Um, I need to re-engage you as a coach and help me build this team. And they flew me to uh, San Diego uh, in the beginning of 2020. And I spent 10 days on their uh, company kickoff, coaching the senior leaders. And that was the company that hired me for the book. So, you know, I just follow it all backwards. If I hadn't had the intention to make a lot of money for the association and charity, if I hadn't, you know, originally had the intention, you don't know where that intention is going to lead you. Now, I'm telling you some great stories. Obviously, there's been some hiccups along the way and some missteps that I've made. 
but it's intentionality that is making the difference. You see, you, all of you, make a difference. And the thing that inspires me the most is that I share something with somebody and then they share it with somebody and it pays it forwards. This is me with a group of teenagers in 2019. Because I talked about self-leadership, I got a call from a bank. And the, I got the call because a member of my association had said, you should call Andrew. And they said, Andrew, we have a leadership program for you. And I'm like, great. You know, that's what I do. You know, I'm thinking little I, money in the bank account. And they said, it's a bit different. I said, that's fine. Bring it on. I'm up for challenges. And they said, it's with teenagers. And I'm thinking, how hard could it be? Well, it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. You know, standing in front of teenagers, and these were at-risk, disadvantaged teenagers, and they wanted me to teach self-esteem, self self-confidence, get them to speak up and to be leaders. I stood in front of these teenagers and they're all sitting on the floor at this bank's headquarters. Um, they had this beautiful black and white place in Singapore. And I realized something that I've spoken about, but this put it to the test, authenticity. You see, these kids could, they could spot, a, they could spot BS at 100 paces. And I had to drop any vestige of facade or face or posture that I had, and I had to get real with them. And doing that program, I think I learned more about myself than, than I benefited them. But we got the kids through, and they had a graduation. It was awesome. They all gave a speech, and I cried. And then the next year, I got a phone call, and they said, you know, could you, could you do this again? And I said, well, it's on Saturday mornings and it's about 10 weeks of commitment. I'm pretty busy. And they said, we'll pay your full fee. And I went, well, I'm less busy. <laughs> and I, but I was curious, why can you pay my full fee? Uh, you know, I, uh, this is a charity thing. They said, yeah, well, you know, we get lots of great publicity. Uh, it's corporate social responsibility. We actually get a tax credit for this. Um, and the mentors that we sent along to your program from the bank said it was the best leadership program they ever had. And we've promoted every single one of them because they've become better human beings. And that actually was a side effect of my original intentionality. Sometimes things are orthogonal. They come off on a, on a 90 degree angle. The bee visits the flower because it's after the nectar. But as the bee visits the flower collecting the nectar, it also picks up the pollen, which fertilizes the flowers. Sometimes we make a difference orthogonally at 90 degrees to what we intended to do. And I ran that program for five years. But as we close, and I've talked about some of my success, I know that talking about what, what's happened for you can make other people feel uncomfortable. And I know that I, not everybody's a fan of Andrew Bryan, and that's okay. And as a past president of the association, I was talking to Dr. Tanvi Gautam. This is Tanvi. She and I run the Women in Leadership Program at Singapore Management University together. And, you know, we were talking about, and she was sort of asking me, how do you sleep at night knowing that there are some people in the world who don't like you? Because the moment you step up into a leadership position, leadership is not a popularity contest. And I remembered Jim Carrey. Remember Jim Carrey, $10 million check? And I remember a tweet of his. How do you sleep at night? with no underwear in case they want to kiss my ass. So you go ahead and be successful, have an intention. Don't do it as a popularity contest because not everybody is going to believe in your mission and your intent because it makes them feel not okay. So you can find me through LinkedIn. You can find me on my YouTube channel. Um, as I said, there's a, there's a channel there on professional speaking. Uh, the recording for this will go there. But here is the thing that you want to do. We've got a whole four minutes for one question and nothing came in the chat box I was watching. Now, either that means you have no question or I was so mesmerizing that you just didn't have time to think. Do we have one question that I've got three minutes now to answer? Um, and Wendy Lee says she's speechless. Well, that's not good for a speaker. All right, going once, going twice. I still have three minutes. 
Elizabeth, no, uh, hello, Elizabeth. You, we're, we're connected. Elizabeth, you have a speech. Uh, sorry, you have a question. Well, I have a speech. You have, I do. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yeah. If, if me, a person, isn't used to setting intentions, how do we start? Uh, so, you know, that's a, that is a great question, one I hadn't thought of, because we all actually set intentions, right? If you set an alarm clock to get out of bed in the morning, at, and I, as I did this morning, you set an intention. You said, I'm going to get out at a certain time, and you used in self-leadership what we call self-regulation to make sure that happened. And if you can set an, an alarm to get up at 7 o'clock, then you got up at 7 o'clock. What's your intention for the day? Right. So you can go through a day or you can say, today, I'm going to accomplish three things. Right. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to finish that post that I was going to do. And I'm going to play with my grandkids or whatever. You know, and so then you've actually built the muscle of intention. And if you can do that for a day, what are you going to do for a month? And then what are you going to do for a year? And once you've got good at that, what are you going to do for your life? Because when I turned 60 in August, the reason I went off a, a week with my friend uh, Frederick was to think about, I got the next 10 years, it's going to be the most productive 10 years of my life. What am I going to do? It's huge. At which point I need, it's 53. Is that a question, Jessica, or are you taking over? No, it is a question because you can answer it in two minutes, one minute. Ah, what's the difference uh -huh. between a smart goal and an intention? That's a good question. So um, intentionality, go, a goal is uh, takes you on a milestone. The intention is the end of the journey. So I, I would set a goal to hit the one mile mark or the five kilometer mark, depending where in the world you are. Um, that's a goal. I'm going to achieve this. But my intention goes beyond that, right? So the intention to get your certified speaking professional qualification is, is actually a goal. The intention is to be a better speaker, is to commit to continual improvement to impact more people's lives. So the intention is bigger than the goal. Right, right, perfect on time. And what an excellent finishing, the intention, right? And all of us, we have all these dreams and goals. And, uh, and I think you just laid it so clearly for us that without the intention, it's I don't know, it was, I loved it. And I, I want to thank you deeply that you brought this important message about the energy of it, not just the practicality of becoming a professional speaker and leading us through the journey of your 25 years, starting with health is wealth and getting that recorded. And you took us through a, a journey of the life of Andrew Bryant. I can see it as a movie now. <laughs> on Netflix, coming soon. Yes, on Netflix. And my gosh, turning 60, yeah. You look fantastic. So health is wealth, obviously. Um, so uh, congratulations to um, setting intentionalities for uh, a life that has in inspired me to be very clear about what I want um, and why I want it. Why? Big question, right? The VSA, can we give, uh, can you unmute yourself? It always sounds nicer. And if you have one of these around, a round of applause for Andrew Bryant. Thank him for coming today.